Over to you, Jared. You can start now. Great. Thank you again for that uh, kind introduction. Apologies for technical delays. It's great to meet new people as well as see familiar faces. Nice to have uh, uh, Dr. Loy Al Khatib on today, who was one of our previous fellows. So, We do have disclosure, so we have institutional research and educational support uh, through multiple vendors at Pan Am Clinic to support our fellowship and research. I'd also like to acknowledge some of my uh, mentors that have sort of shaped my uh, understanding of massive rotator cuff tears and, and how they're treated. So when we talk about massive rotator cuff tears, this is an incredibly challenging and controversial topic. And I think this is why I find it so interesting is there's many different ways that these can be treated. There's many trends that occur over time. And the retail rates right now range anywhere from 25 to 94%, which is quite substantial. And it makes it very difficult to know whether we should be observing these patients, whether we should be repairing them whether we should be performing a superior capsular reconstruction, a tendon transfer, or a balloon augmentation. There's so many different options that it gets quite difficult to, to sort out where we should be going. When we're talking with our fellows, this is one of the uh, quotes that uh, Arthur Ashe had had, one important key to success is self-confidence. An important key to self-confidence is preparation. And so, especially with these massive rotator cuff tears, you need to step back and really critically assess both the patient and some of the preoperative imaging and evaluation, including x-rays and MRI. And that's sort of the approach that I'll share with you today. So I first, I'm gonna go over some definitions. So some anatomy and biomechanics, as well as tendon quality. So we're all talking about the same thing. Then we'll talk about different ways that we can predict an irreparable tear through preoperative evaluation and then discuss some of the treatment options, including non-surgical options, as well as palliative care, uh, which is basically treating the pain uh, and allowing for improved function, but not addressing the pathology itself. So these include debridement, uh, biceps tenotomy or tenodesis, suprascapular nerve decompression, or balloon placement, as well as reconstructive options, such as superior capsular reconstruction or tendon transfers. So if you wanna go back and see some of these things that we've talked about today, this was a critical analysis review that we had performed in 2018. It goes through a little bit of an algorithm that follows uh, in line with what I'll be talking about today uh, about irreparable tears and, and how we treat them and decide on which of these treatments may be best. Another thing to mention is that we're gonna be talking about joint salvage procedures. So obviously the reverse has had a huge role in more elderly patients in treating this pathology. So this will be in cases of younger patients where we're trying to salvage the joint. This here is a case example of someone in their young 50s. When I hold his arm at 60 degrees of external rotation at his side, you can see he has a leg back to neutral. And at 90 degrees of abduction and external rotation, he falls to about 45 degrees. So this loss of active external rotation has a significant impact on patients' activities of daily living. This individual is no longer able to get his hand to his mouth to drink from a glass of water or to uh, wash his hair in the shower. When we evaluate his MRI in the bottom corner there, you can see that this is a massive tear. It's retracted to the level of the glenoid. And then despite having a hypertrophied teres minor, he's unable to uh, externally rotate. And you can see that there's high-grade fatty infiltration of the infraspinatus tendon. So going back to those anatomy and biomechanic discussions, we all understand force couples, and these are clearly disrupted in a case like I just showed. Um, Dr. Burkhart taught us a lot about these. And then this can result in weakness or external rotation lag signs. Uh, one way that this was described is sort of like reins of a horse and you have full control of the shoulder as long as you have front and back, even if you're missing the supraspinatus. And if you're able to repair those, you regain control. But if you're missing one, then you lose control of the shoulder. So when we talk about tear size, a massive rotator cuff tear can, was defined initially by Dr. Cofield. And he said that this was a five centimeter tear of exposed greater tuberosity. And this obviously is a little bit ambiguous and can change if you have a small female versus a large male that may actually be a larger or smaller proportion of the rotator cuff. And so this was later uh, modified by Dr. Gerber who reported that this was a two tendon tear. And specific to our discussion today, we'll be reviewing 
supraspinatus and infraspinatus or posterior superior massive rotator cuff tears with repairable uh, subscapularis. So if we define a massive rotator cuff tear as greater than five centimeters and greater than or equal to two tendons, then the next thing we need to determine is whether or not this is a tear, a tear that's repairable or irreparable. Now, the irreparable is initially defined as a tear that cannot be repaired to the anatomic footprint despite tendon mobilization. And I would argue that we can go a bit further and find some preoperative clues to identify this ahead of time. So the most important question in my practice when treating these patients is determining if the tendon is repairable. And we do have some of these preoperative clues, such as the Grutalier classification, pate grade, and tendon length. Although there's many more that you can use, including Hamada grade, as well as a tangent sign. So it's a little bit a la carte. You need to pick what works for you. These are the three that I routinely use in my practice and that we routinely go through with our fellows here at Pan Am. So when we talk about tendon quality, we all know this classification, but I'll review each of them briefly. Gutalier classification goes from grade zero to grade four. So if you have a healthy muscle with no fatty streaks, grade zero, that would be normal. And that's in image A. And that can advance all the way up to grade four, where you actually have less uh, muscle than fat present, as you can see in image E here, where it's almost entirely filled with fat. Another metric that we use is the pate grade, and this is the degree of retraction. So you can see with a stage one, this is overlying, the tendons overlying the greater tuberosity. For a stage two, this is retracted to the midhumeral head. And for a stage three, this is retracted to the level of the glenoid. And another important factor that we use regularly is tendon length. And this was described by Dr. Dominic Myers at Balgris. And this is a surrogate measure of the elasticity of the tendon, which is not synchronous with muscle shortening, which occurs earlier. And this tends to occur in the late stages of disease and is a real sign of chronicity and has major implications on repairability uh, or failure rates long-term. So when we review those three things that we typically use, Gutalia grade, pate grade, and tendon length. So now looking at uh, predicting whether these tears are repairable preoperatively. So just Gutalia grade alone is actually very predictive. Uh, in some studies with a grade three, failure rates have been shown up to 100%. So as you get higher Gutalia grades, uh, this should be relatively predictable that you'll either be unable to repair the tendon or be at a high risk for failure. You can also use combinations of these different factors. So if you take fatty infiltration of grade two on a Gutalier and combine that with retraction to the level of the glenoid with a pate grade three, this is actually showing 98% specificity for an irreparable tear. Similarly, uh, this work by Dr. Dominic Meyer, if you look at the supraspinatus tendon and its tendon length, as you can see measured there, if this is less than 15 millimeters and you combine that with a Gutalier grade, of grade two or grade three, you can see that the retear rate in those patients was 92%. So by using some of these combinations of fatty infiltration, pate grade, as well as tendon length, you can get a good sense of whether or not this is gonna be a repairable tendon. Assuming that your MRI was performed at a reasonable time prior to your surgery, which sometimes is a challenge for us in Canada and maybe the same in other uh, places around the world. So let's talk about some of the treatment options. There's a wide variety. None of them are necessarily right or wrong. We have non-operative options, as well as palliative treatment, debridement, biceps, tendesis, or suprascapular nerve release, as well as the reconstructive options. And so, as Dr. Albert Einstein said, if we knew what we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? And this really applies to massive rotator cuff tears because there's such a wide variety and this is expanding uh, and evolving all the time. So I think one of the most important things when treating these patients non-operatively or looking at the natural history is understanding that massive rotator cuffs actually behave very differently than a one or two centimeter tear that's degenerative in a 70 year old uh, that occurred uh, over time or insidiously. These tears have been shown to get bigger weaker, atrophic, retracted, contracted, and fatty infiltrated. And massive, kit, massive rotator cuff tears have been shown to become irreparable. 
So when we look at the clinical and structural outcomes, when we follow these patients non-operatively, Dr. Gerber's group looked at this with sequential MRIs over time and showed that there is increased tear size, increased fatty infiltration. The heads tend to elevate over time and these patients do get progressive arthritis. And this isn't necessarily applicable if someone is 67 years old and it's gonna happen over a number of years and they could be a candidate for reverse. But with over 50% of these tears becoming irreparable in less than four years, if someone's in their late 40s, early to mid 50s, these things do become quite relevant and benign neglect may not be benign. So when we start talking about the different surgical treatment options, I think we have to relate back to Dr. Codman, uh, who nearly 100 years ago defined uh, quality as the cost divided by the outcome. And there's many new products that are being released on a regular basis, and some of these are quite expensive. And so we need to uh, weigh the risks and benefits as well as the cost and the outcome to make sure that we're providing quality care on a societal level. So Dr. Codman said that rotator cuff tears occur in a predictable pattern and we must recognize these patterns to allow for improved outcomes. When you look here back a hundred years ago, he identified that if a patient actually improved from surgery, it was actually very cost-effective. It was quite cheap. You can see here at that time, $763 to treat this patient that had an improved outcome. If they did not have an improvement in their outcome and they ended up coming back multiple times for repeat procedures, then this ended up costing over five fold. And in some cases here, you can see over 10 or 15 fold the cost of a failed surgery. So very significant and need to consider what, uh, what we're doing for the first intervention. So when we go back to, is the tendon repairable? So we use our Gutalier stage, pate grade, tendon length, and previous failed rotator cuff repairs I often consider irreparable as well. And like I said, there's other factors that you can incorporate into your own practice, such as tangent sign and hematic grade. But if you determine that this tendon is repairable, then you should do this acutely uh, before a lot of this degenerative uh, stuff tends to take place. And you can see here, this is an example of a case of mine where this person had a massive rotator cuff tear. It actually involved the subscapularis, supraspinatus, and infraspinatus, and was quite retracted, but very mobile. And retraction in itself, if you have normal uh, tendon as well as um, no evidence of fatty infiltration, retraction alone does not influence outcome and out excellent outcomes can be achieved by performing an acute and direct repair. So what about if this is not repairable? Well, then we can look at what the different palliative and reconstruction options are. So biceps tenotomy or tenodesis, especially if someone's getting older and getting up to that age where you could uh, proceed with a reverse shoulder replacement in you know, a number of years, there's modest functional improvement that can be achieved just by releasing the biceps tendon or performing a tenodesis at five years follow-up. Similarly, if you perform a partial repair, the early outcomes of partial repair are actually quite, uh, quite impressive. Although there is deterioration at approximately two years and uh, further at five years with high failure rates that approach 40%. And then suprascapular nerve, there's a little bit less evidence on this, but certainly in patients who have select injections and pain relief at the suprascapular notch uh, can, be, uh, uh, can achieve a good outcome following release. Now, what about the reconstructive options? So the three main ones, although there's been others that have have been described, the three main ones that are being performed are superior capsular reconstruction, latissimus dorsi tendon transfer, as well as lower trapezius tendon transfer. So when we look at superior capsular reconstruction, this is basically uh, removal of the supraspinatus tendon here. You can see here the infraspinatus is in, intact, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later, but you take a, a, a graft and attach that to the greater tuberosity as well as the glenoid to act as a static spacer. This here shows bridging, this here shows a superior capsular reconstruction. And this was originally described by Dr. Mahada, who looked at 24 shoulders and they used autograft fascia lata with a follow-up of 34 months. They showed that they had improvements in elevation, external rotation, as well as ASES scores. 
And the radiographic outcomes also improved. So the acromial humeral index improved from 4.8 to 8.7, and they had no graft or tendon re-tears. So essentially, they showed exceptional clinical and radiographic outcomes with nearly three years of follow-up. And this really changed how a lot of massive rotator cuff tears were being uh, treated. And there was a general shift away from latissimus dorsi transfer to people doing superior capsular reconstruction. But it wasn't only good outcomes. Many people uh, were experiencing failures of their own. And when we looked at this at Massachusetts General, this was a slightly disruptive uh, study that we published in JSES, but showed extremely high failure rates. This was a combination of six different surgeons at Massachusetts General that were doing cases. And in cases of infraspinatus fatty infiltration of grade two or greater, there was an 84% failure rate. We also saw that patients who had previous revision surgery were more likely to fail. And not surprising, uh, surgeon volume was a big predictor. So if you'd done less than 10 cases, and this has been shown with many other uh, techniques, including you know, arthroscopic rotator cuff repair when it first presented, as well as uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty that you know, a surgeon's volume can have a big impact on the outcomes, as well as female gender. Now, this was one of the first studies to show these high failure rates, but a recent systematic review shows that there's actually a wide range in the failure rates when you look at uh, superior capsular reconstruction, where Mahata's initial study here shows very low or around 10% failure rate, some nearly 0%, but others go right out to about 70% uh, failure rates or overall complication rates. And when you see this huge range compared to what it started as, it's probably one of two things. Either we're doing different procedures and thinking we're doing the same, or we're doing it on different patients with more broad indications that we may not, maybe shouldn't be doing them in. And it's probably more of the latter, although we did discuss that learning curve. And when we looked back at some of the biomechanical data that Dr. Mahata had published, they showed that this was for an isolated supraspinatus tendon tear. We showed recently, and this is accepted for publication, that if you repair the infraspinatus at the time of superior capsule reconstruction, that although the outcomes are initially delayed, that these patients have significantly improved outcomes over time if there is a repairable infraspinatus, sort of fitting with his initial biomechanical data. Other things that are a bit different than what we do typically in North America is they use a fascia lata autograft, whereas typically a dermal allograft is used in North America. And they showed that graft thickness was an important factor where if the graft was eight millimeters thick, they actually had a better biomechanical outcome than if it was four millimeters thick. And we typically use a three millimeter dermal allograft. So I think all of these things have influenced the outcome. Certainly many people around the world have had outstanding outcomes with superior capsular reconstruction. In my own practice, I use this for patients that have preserved range of motion, as well as an intact or repairable subscapularis and infraspinatus. Now, in patients that have an irreparable infraspinatus, uh, my preference is to perform a dynamic restoration of force couples, and this can be done with either a latissimus dorsi transfer or a lower trapezius transfer. When we go back and look at some of the biomechanical uh, data that uh, Dr. El Hassan performed at Mayo Clinic, you can see that the lower trapezius actually has the largest external rotation moment arm when the arm is held at the side and externally rotated, very similar to that of the infraspinatus tendon itself. Now, when the arm is held at 90 degrees of abduction, the latissimus dorsi that comes over the top appears to have a slight advantage here, although this was not statistically significant. So if you were going to perform both of these transfers for different reasons, it may be advantageous to do the lower trapezius when the external rotation lag sign or weakness is greatest with the arm at the side than at 90 degrees. Uh, my preference has been to do almost exclusively lower trapezius transfer and I think proficiency in one of these two uh, techniques is uh, likely of benefit. So what are the outcomes? 
If you look at latissimus dorsi transfer, this can be done either open or arthroscopically assisted, although most of the long-term data uh, that comes out of the Balgris group was using the open procedure. They had 70 to 90% good results in most studies. And you can see in this uh, video here, this is just a, uh, a brief case that we had done. This is dissecting out the latissimus dorsi. The arm is in maximum forward elevation and internal rotation, releasing that from the humerus. And then basically do a whip stitch to bring this into a uh, tendon that we can then uh, dissect out under traction. So we're identifying the neurovascular uh, bundle here and then performing further releases from the chest wall to ensure that this can easily get up over uh, to the posterior aspect of the acromion and to the greater tuberosity. Here we're dissecting between the deltoid and the infraspinatus fascia. And then we bring this tendon up through this interval over the greater tuberosity and then insert it into the greater tuberosity with self-punching anchors. So the outcomes with 46 latissimus dorsi transfers in Dr. Gerber's group shows uh, at a follow-up of 147 months, improvement in SSV scores from 29% to 70%, constant scores significantly improved as well as improvements in flexion and external rotation. So what about lower trapezius tendon transfer? Well, this has several advantages. One, that it's in line, and the other, that it's in phase. And you can see that these muscle fibers go directly in line with the infraspinatus tendon. And so we use an Achilles allograft to shuttle into the joint, attach that same as if we'd done the latissimus dorsi transfer, and then split this Achilles tendon into two distally. One limb of this is then passed through the uh, lower trapezius transfer in a pulper tap fashion and sewn into place with the other limb uh, placed over top and sewn to both. The outcomes of the arthroscopically assisted technique show similar outcomes to the lower trapezius or sort of the uh, latissimus dorsi transfer with improvements in flexion, abduction, external rotation, as well as SSB scores up at 80%. And it's worth noting that these are very severely uh, uh, damaged shoulders with 46% having true pseudoparalysis with less than 60 degrees of forward elevation. Two thirds of these patients had a previous failed rotator cuff repair and that uh, a reparable subscapularis is not a contraindication. This is an example of mine where the subscapularis was retracted to the level of the glenoid. We've done a 270 degree release of this tendon and now you can see it has good mobility out to the lesser tuberosity and it's repaired in place. I watch each of these. You have to put the arm up into abduction and external rotation in order to hook your lower trapezius tendon transfer in. So I directly watch these under uh, arthroscopic visualization as you bring it up into external rotation to ensure that subscapularis repair uh, is robust. So when we look at arthroscopic lower trapezius transfers, uh, and their outcomes, they provide equivalent to latissimus dorsi uh, for arthroscopic, but both of these techniques uh, show improvement over the original open technique that you can see here at 24 months. So let's go back to that original case example. So this is a patient that has a massive rotator cuff tear. It involves the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. They have external rotation lag signs both at their side and overhead. And when we look at the MRI, you can see that they have a pate grade of three, less than 15 millimeters of tendon length, and grade four fatty infiltration in the infraspinatus. So this in my hands is a patient uh, that requires dynamic restoration of the force couples with a tendon transfer. I performed a lower trapezius tendon transfer in this case. You can see that this is quite a robust tendon. You can basically pick the patient up off the bed uh, with this harvest. Have released it from the super scapula or from the scapular spine, and we release that superficial fascia, but you leave this deep fascia intact because the neurovascular bundle sits underneath, as you can see there. After we release this from the chest wall, you can see you get approximately eight centimeters of excursion, and then when we pierce the lower trapezius tendon, we then pull uh, the Achilles tendon through and back on itself, and sew that into place in a pulver tap fashion, and then bring the remaining fifty percent over the top. So this is a completed lower trapezius transfer. You can see it's sewn into place. It's a very large muscle in the back. And as you take the arm through internal and external rotation, you can see that this now moves in conjunction 
with the greater tuberosity and the arm as it rotates through internal and external rotation. So this is a one-year post-op. His subjective shoulder value had increased from 10% to 80%. He's restored active external rotation and the ability to perform activities of daily living. He can hold his arm at approximately 30 to 40 degrees of external rotation and can externally rotate here to approximately 70 degrees. And you'll notice that he's missing approximately 20 degrees of external rotation, both at his side and uh, at 90 degrees. And I find this to be quite typical and likely relates to the reduced excursion of the lower trapezius in comparison to the normal anatomy. So this is not his case, but this is another uh, post-operative MRI that we have of a lower trapezius uh, transfer. Uh, you can see here that the lower trapezius comes over the top and is inserting into the greater tuberosity. Uh, this here shows the Achilles tendon passing directly in line with the infraspinatus. And then you can see here that it's wrapping around the back. And I don't typically uh, get MRIs postoperatively. This patient here was a, a WCB patient that was, uh, was sort of grumbling along. And we got this to prove that the tendon was in fact intact. So looking at some of the take-home points for massive rotator cuff tears, I think the first thing is that massive tears behave very differently than typical rotator cuff tears. So these tears tend to increase in size, they increase in fatty infiltration, they increase in their degree of retraction, and arthritis tends to progress over time. When we look at reparability, uh, these can often be predicted preoperatively, so it's important to take the time to prepare for these cases, and if it's repairable, find time to fix these acutely. And for the irreparable tears, we have many different options, including both palliative and reconstructive options. The latissimus dorsi transfer has the best long-term data, although tends to be falling out of favor with superior capsular reconstruction and lower trapezius emerging as uh, nearly equivalent alternatives. So thank you very much for your time. I have some photos here. This is uh, Dr. Loy al khatib during his fellowship with us here at Pan Am Clinic. This photo in the middle is actually, uh, we, we uh, largely run at a COVID free hospital and we were on call together on Christmas day. And uh, this is the two of us just getting ready to go do our first COVID patient that came into uh, our hospital. And then this is uh, Loy with uh, Dr. Peter McDonald who is our chair here in Winnipeg and also the incoming ACS president. So thank you very much for your time and I'll open it up for any questions that the group has. Thank you, Jared, for that uh, brilliant presentation of yours and congratulations for the number of papers that you have churned out in, the, in a short period of time. And Thanks. we are also joined by Loy al Khatib as an orthopedic surgeon is based in Winnipeg and he's also a very dynamic surgeon doing fellowships across the world. And now currently he's in Winnipeg and I think very soon he's going to go back to Germany, isn't it, Loy? Okay, uh, just a couple of okay. questions uh, before I hand it over to Loy. Uh, Jared, uh, are there any risk of neurological injuries when you do these uh, transfers? Because you're going through a critical zone where there is a lot of neurological structures. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of the lower trapezius, it's, I think it's a very safe uh, operation. You could see when I was doing that dissection that the neurovascular bundle for the lower trapezius itself does live on that inferior surface. So you have to take care not to disrupt the fascia on the inferior surface, but you can split this, the superficial fascia to allow the junction between the middle and the lower trapezius to split. But then when that passes through the infraspinatus uh, fossa into the shoulder, there's really nothing there. So that, that's quite safe. When you're doing the latissimus dorsi, I think this has caused some nerves. It certainly can be done very safely, um, but you do have to take care for the radial nerve. Uh, it actually lies over top and you can palpate it and should palpate it when you're dissecting that out. Um, so just being aware of where that is and that it lays over top of the latissimus dorsi during harvest, it would be important. I think the overall risks and, and uh, permanent neurologic deficit to my understanding is quite low. Thank you, Jared, for that. Uh, Jared, uh, would you mind stop sharing your screen so that, yeah, you can actually, yeah, there's an option to stop share at the bottom. So you can remove the PPT off. 
Sorry, I'll just. Uh... No worries. Yeah, boys, it's okay. There you go. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Uh, also, Jared, the other question is regarding uh, anterior superior tears, for example, subscap tears. What is the experience with pectoralis major transverse? That is the other option, right? Yeah. So for anterior superior tears, uh, when I was uh, working at Mayo Clinic, Dr. El Hassan had popularized using the latissimus dorsi transfer. So you basically dissect out the latissimus dorsi and mobilize it and get it can get it up to the top of the lesser tuberosity. So that has been my preference over doing a split pectoralis transfer and seems to show improved biomechanics in terms of the line of pull because it comes from the back. It's more in line with the subscapularis and also allows to be used as a head depressor as it's sort of pulling down and back. So I know many people have had great success with uh, pectoralis major transfers. I personally have not done those in my practice. Uh, for subscapularis deficiency, I use latissimus dorsi transfer. Uh, I have done it for serratus deficiency. Thank you, Jared. Just one more question from our side. Now, have you encountered a situation when you're going ahead with a standard rotator cuff repair, standard arthroscopic single roll or double row repair, and then you find that, okay, it's not repairable, and suddenly you shift to one of the transfers? So for myself, I try to make that decision preoperatively. So I've never actually had a tear that was irreparable that I then switched to a transfer intraoperatively. And I think these are just very different things for patients to understand as well as the amount of time that it's going to take in the OR. So you're right. I have had that situation where a tendon that I thought was repairable no longer was. And I think the time from MRI can play a big role in that. And we have some difficulty with that in Canada, and I'm sure others do around the world with COVID-19 back, uh, backlogs, but I have had those situations. And in that circumstance, I've proceeded with uh, completion of a biceps tenodesis as well as a partial rotator cuff repair. And then I have that conversation with the patient in clinic. And I have had situations where I've gone back and done a tendon transfer as a secondary stage, but, but I've never sort of converted mid case to, to doing a tendon transfer uh, based on an intraoperative finding. Thank you, Jared, for that. I'll over to you, Loy, for further proceedings. Loy, questions yeah. from your side. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Woodmas, for the excellent presentation. Thanks again for the great talk and the knowledge and experience you offered in my state. With you, one of the questions I think from Finland is asking about what's your approach for a pain persistence after a water tight repair of a case of uh, massive rotator cuff tear? Is any patient comes with a pain persistence after you, you perform a repair? What would be your approach for this patient? So for persistence of pain, um, we have typical recovery curves. So every patient that we have, we have in a registry. And so we can sort of identify where they are over time. And so when someone falls off of that plan by more than you know, one or two standard deviations, that would be an indication for me to get an MRI. I usually don't repeat image people before six months because I think people can sort of lag. Uh, but in those cases, the, the first thing or the number one thing that I would think of uh, in someone with persistent pain would be a failure of the repair. We know that these uh, failures can be quite high. If the tendon is intact, then you can start thinking about, you know, some other things that may be, you know, secondary pain generators, such as AC joint, if you haven't addressed the biceps tendon or suprascapular nerve. Uh, but for me, the, the number one reason for someone having persistent pain is usually a failure of the repair. Thanks. Uh, Matthias asked me from Germany, any tips on how to identify the morphology of the tear? And when to achieve an adequate cuff mobilization. Sorry, can you please the last part of that? How do I identify the morphology of the tear? And uh, if there's any tips to achieve an adequate cuff mobilization, I think he, his meaning of the uh, internus anterior and posterior internal sides. Right. Yeah, so when you're looking at the at tendon mobility, usually when I start the case, I will uh, go in and do the biceps tenodesis first. And I always do a, a subscapularis repair as the first step if that is 
uh, present. So that requires a full 273 release where I'll pull, put a traction suture in and pull that out the back to do the junction between the conjoint tendon and the subscapularis, expose the entire undersurface of the uh, coracoid and then pull that traction suture out the front to release that capsule uh, down towards uh, the inferior aspect of the glenoid. The subscapularis, unless there's great four fatty infiltration on the MRI is, is often uh, repairable. And when you bring that back, it actually brings the anterior part of the supraspinatus back as well. And then you can use traction sutures to identify whether the posterior superior cuff is, is repairable. I think that that anterior interval slide is, is incredibly important. So releasing all of that tissue at the, the base of the coracoid and up into a um, intracapsular uh, release. In my own practice, I have not used posterior interval uh, slides. Uh, if someone needs that, then I typically convert to either graft augmentation or a tendon transfer. Awesome, thanks. And one thing I learned from you during my uh, training at the real supervision is the reduction or to reduce the rotator cuff, it's not a direct pull from medial to lateral. It's always there's an angle uh, you go uh, anterior superior with, uh, with your reduction of rotator cuff. Um, one of the questions asking me, in countries where there's no allograft, I think he means the Achilles uh, tendon allograft, how can you prefer a lower trap transfer? And would it be the same outcome, would be provide you a same outcome as a using an allograft? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, you know, it's not just different countries, it's also different institutions may not have uh, those resources available to them. Um, George Athwal in Canada uh, has actually popularized a technique that is for lower trapezius transfer where he will harvest a hamstring tendon and attach that to the uh, lower trapezius and then shuttle that through. And then he drills a hole with a, like an ACL reamer uh, through the infraspinatus footprint and then out through the bicipital groove and then uh, fixes that over either a button or uh, with uh, screw fixation. So I think that's an excellent uh, option for anyone who wants to perform this technique um, and does not have access to an Achilles graft. Awesome, thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, what are your thoughts on suprascapital and nerve release in cases of massive cuff tear? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting concept. I've certainly performed uh, them. I, I find that I'm doing less and less. Um, when you perform the, the super, or when you perform a, a rotator cuff repair, in my own mind, I think that that actually takes the pressure off of, off of the nerve. And so I, I did a lot more when I first started my practice, but uh, I think performing the, the repair, I think actually takes that pressure off the nerve and I've been doing them less and less. Awesome. Any more questions, Loy? Uh, I think that's it. Okay, I think uh, we'll wind up the session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Woodmas, for that fantastic presentation and Loy for moderating it. I'm sure this lecture is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much, both of you. Great. Thank you so much for having me.